I'm Pete Zielinski with Modern Machine Shop Magazine. I'm here with Dr. Julia Shoup, machining expert with TechSolve. And we're gonna do some ugly machining. We're gonna do machining the way it is not meant to be done. But we're doing that for a reason. We're talking about cutting forces. Cutting forces, an invisible part of the process, but measuring forces, analyzing them, can show what's happening in the process and even help diagnose what's going wrong. So, Julius, how are we measuring forces on this machine? Pete, I think the way most people are accustomed to measuring cutting forces, or maybe I would say monitoring them, is by looking at the spindle load meter. But the spindle load meter only tells you one component of the force and does so very inaccurately because you've got all the inefficiencies of the motor. If you want to dig a little deeper, then you need what's called a three-component dynamometer. And this dyno, as we call it, is mounted on this machine right now. It's holding the tool, and we get not just the tangential cutting force, but we also get two other components, the feed force, and we're also getting the plowing force or radial force. And we can study these, study these as they evolve through the cut or as the tool wears out to draw some much more informed conclusions. So here are resources a typical shop typically wouldn't have. Is this where TechSolve gets involved? Absolutely. So this dyno is actually quite expensive. It's tens of thousands of dollars. But for us, it's more than worth it because when we come in and we try to maybe assist somebody with machining an exotic material with a difficult setup, maybe a machine that isn't very stable, um, lights out machining, you want the absolute most secure, stable process possible, there's really no way around going and doing a little more advanced analysis. And that's where the dyno really shines and, and gives us information we just couldn't get otherwise. All right, so here are some intentionally ugly machining passes. Ugly in terms of the, the dynamometer output, the force profiles. So Julius, uh, I'm looking at this force profile and it starts out well, but then something happens. It gets bushy and then it sort of turns into a fern leaf. How did we construct this machining pass? What did we deliberately do wrong? This tool was totally out of its element and it failed prematurely. And that premature failure and rapid wear that we saw on this tool shows up in the forces. And we can see that not only does the force increase, but we actually are starting to see some instability. We start to see some chatter. We start to see some breaking out of the edge that just continues to get worse and worse. And I would actually consider this catastrophic failure. This tool just is absolutely ill-suited to take this cut. And we knew this going in, but I think the forces really highlight what is happening and that we really see a dramatic increase in the force. So that was a case where we knew something was going wrong without, without the dyno. Exactly. Um, here's a force profile showing a somewhat more consistent cut. This looks really shaggy, but it's pretty steady shagginess. How did we do this cut? Yeah, in this case, what we did is we picked a finishing tool to take a roughing pass. And if you do pick such a tool for the, the wrong kind of cut, as I would call it, then you end up with a lot of chatter, a lot of instability. The geometry is too positive. Because of that, we're just skipping. And this tool is sort of like a chisel that is being pushed over a, a smooth surface. And we're sort of getting stuck. And we're, we're just chattering along. Um, this type of cut is not stable. And you could actually get catastrophic failure of the tool at any point, because these fluctuations in the force can actually break the tool unexpectedly. So now this force profile shows the result of our attempt to fix that. What did you change about the process that resulted in sort of this, this tighter variation of the forces? Yeah, what we did is we, um, we considered the fact that our machine just wasn't rigid enough to rough with this very, very high positive sharp finishing tool. And we picked a little more negative geometry. We picked a, a thicker coating and a more roughing type chip breaker. And what we're seeing right away is that we're still breaking the chip, but we're also getting a much, much smoother force profile. That plowing effect that this thicker tool has actually provides some damping in the process. And that actually makes up for the um, lack of stiffness that we have in the machine tool system. So one more ugly cut. This is one that seems stable here and there. And the the variation we see isn't a lot, but uh, it gets bushy in some places, settles down in some places. It's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. What did we do wrong here, and what are you seeing? Yeah, I think any time we see any type of inconsistency in the process, and it's not due to a change maybe in the depth of cut or in different types of features, it's a red flag. We don't want to see that. We always want a nice, steady force profile. When I see the forces going in and out, and maybe there even being some regularity to it, 
the first thought is that there might be a condition of unstable built up edge, which might also be connected to excessive tool wear. And in this case, it seems we had excessive tool wear, which then led to this build up of the edge, led to some chatter. The edge that was built up would come off, it was unstable. We get a nice steady cut until it builds up again. And so we get the cyclical pattern of chatter, no chatter. Really not a good position to be in because the tool could actually catastrophically fail at any point. I, I guess, Julius, I don't take this for granted anymore. There are a lot of variables in play to get right, to get a smooth process. Absolutely, Pete. I think it's very important to realize that getting a stable machining process requires all the aspects of that process to come together. So in this case, if we're trying to cut without coolant, we need to make sure we have the right tool for that type of cut. We have the right coating, we've got the right chip breaker. We even need to make sure that the machine tool itself and the work holding is designed to provide adequate stability for that type of process. All of this we can see in the forces. It'd be very difficult to do this empirically or just looking at the spindle load meter, but having the three component dyno allows us to dig deeper and really optimize a process, which can be invaluable if you're trying to cut difficult to machine materials, you're trying to do difficult geometries like thin walls, or you're just trying to run lights out and you wanna make sure you get the utmost process security that you can get.